Can you tell us about a person called Sadhu Om? Sadhu Om was uh, a young boy in Tanjore, that's in the southern part of Tamil Nadu. Uh, I think he started off life as a devotee of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. He read about Bhagavan in the early 1940s. Around that time there was uh, a devotee of Bhagavan called Janaki Mata, who had a small ashram in Tanjore. She used to come regularly to Raman Ashram. Uh, Sadhuam went to see her and learned a little bit more about Bhagavan. And I think on, on one of her trips to Raman Ashram, she brought him along. And he was an aspiring uh, Tamil poet. He, he knew good literary Tamil. He was composing good poetry even before he came to Raman Ashram. So I think it's, it's a kind of tradition. If you have that talent and you go to see a guru, then you compose some song or some poem in praise of the Guru and you present it when you arrive. Sadhuam handed over his poetry and as was the custom at Raman Ashram, if, if anything came that was literary and Tamil, Bhagavan would pass it on to Muragana for any critique, scrutiny, any suggestions for improvements. And I think at that time Muragana was uh, staying in Palakotu. He read it, he came to Bhagavan and I, I seem to recollect he had a very good opinion of Sadhuam's initial verses. And that started a relationship which continued for, where are we, 1946, right through till Muragana passed away in 1973. I think they both had a bond with each other. They felt a passion for Bhagavan, a passion for self-inquiry, a passion for Bhagavan's teachings, a passion for literary Tamil in all its forms. Sadhuam was, how shall we say, a bit more practical than Muragana. Uh, after Bhagavan passed away, uh, he realized that a lot of Muragana's output might be irretrievably lost simply because he wasn't storing it properly, he had no filing system. He was, what we call, an inspired poet. Verses would arrive almost ready-made in his head. He, he sometimes said, I don't even feel as if I'm composing them. I just sit here in a state of absorption with my Guru Bhagavan, and in that state, this stuff spontaneously arises in my head. And I get out a pen and I write it down. And occasionally, he would even write it on a slate with a piece of chalk. And if the next verse came before someone had come along to copy it down from the slate, he'd just wipe it off with his sleeve and that verse would be gone forever. So there was a random but very fruitful flow of poetry coming out of Muragana. Sadiwam looked at this and realized what a treasure trove Muragana had in his room, which at that time was being neglected sounds too strong. It just wasn't being given its proper respect. So Sadiwam took it on himself to uh, collate all these random bits of scraps of paper, make fair copies of everything, put some sort of order into this vast output that Muragana had uh, amassed in his room. So wh when we're talking numbers, um, I think probably over 20,000 verses were uh, composed by Muragana even after Bhagavan passed away. So probably Muragana was writing these things down as fast as Sadhuam could copy them. In, I think, the late 1970s, Sadhuam decided that all of Muragana's unpublished poems had to be brought out in a kind of uh, anthology, organized, slightly edited by topic. So he arranged with Professor Swaminathan, who was then uh, both a devotee and editor of Gandhi's collected works in Delhi, to get a substantial grant from the central government, which came back to uh, Ramana Nagar, where Sadhu On was working. And for years and years and years, he spent his whole time going through all of this vast quantity of material which Muragana had composed. Uh, 
And after Saduam himself passed away, I think in 1985, some of his own followers took over. And the end product of this was a massive nine volume compendium of Murugana's writings. I actually added up the verses out of curiosity last year, and it was 18,000 verses in nine volumes, most of which are praising Bhagavan, thanking him, expressing gratitude for the state that Bhagavan had bestowed on him. But some of them were also teachings. Uh, the last volume, volume nine, contains the poem which eventually was translated and published in English as Padamalai. Uh, we published 1800 verses from that particular collection. So it's a mixture, it's a mixture of teachings, it's a mixture of devotional ecstatic verses and all of this I am genuinely convinced would have been lost to posterity had not Saduam made a big big effort to preserve it in the 1950s and 60s. Towards the end of Murugana's life, Murugana knew that Sadhu Om was probably the only person in the world who could make sense of all of his writings. He by that time had moved into Raman Ashram, he was being looked after by the ashram, but all of his writings, all of his papers were kept in two large trunks which were in uh, his room. This was in the old uh, dispensary and Raman Ashram wanted these trunks of course and Murugana put his foot down, he even, even though he was quite old and sick and feeble at the time, and he gave them an ultimatum. He said, if you don't let Sadhu Om take these papers away and process and edit them properly, I'm going to set them on fire. It, 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 it's, it's either him or nobody. He's the only person in the world who understands what's in them. He's the only person I feel comfortable inheriting them. Anybody else, they'll do a terrible job. And rather than have a terrible job, I prefer to set fire to them. So f faced with this ultimatum, Sadhu Arm, who wasn't really in the good books of the ashram at that point, was uh, allowed to come to Raman Ashram, take off with these trunks, and really, really glad that Murugana put his foot down, really, really glad that Sadhu Arm spent the next 10, 12 years of his life sorting these papers out, because they are a massive, irreplaceable treasure house of teachings of ecstatic uh, verses about the nature of reality and the means by which one can discover it, all through the medium of Sadhu Om's great talent for understanding Murugana and his great talent for getting to the bottom of the nuances of Tamil literature. Concurrently with this, uh, Sadhu Om was also working on uh, a more easy to access version of Guru Vachika Kovai. If we, if I need to go back a little bit on this. In the 1920s and 30s, Murugana used to sit in the hall and listen to Bhagavan teach. Bhagavan would have a conversation or he'd give out some teachings and Murugana would write them down on the spot in four line Tamil verses. And then he would wait either for a gap in the conversation or at the latest the next day and he would show Bhagavan what he had written. Bhagavan would say, that's fine, you did a good job, or he might suggest some correction or improvement. You know, occasionally he would scribble over what Murugan had said. Bhagavan himself knew good literary Tamil. That seemed to be one of his uh, innate talents. I've been told that when he was at school in Madurai, it was the only subject he really excelled in, to the point where he was able to correct his Tamil teacher at the age of 13. I think all the other subjects he wasn't very good at, but Tam Tamil literature, Tamil prosody, he excelled at. So this went on 1920s, 1930s, and in 1939, Bhagavan, who, like everyone else, knew that Murugana was a bit scatterbrained, suggested that these verses be brought out in a book form, and he gave the job of editing and codifying them to Sadhu Natanananda, who was a very good Tamil good Vedantic scholar and somebody who had a proper organized intellect to put Murugana's teachings in a coherent order. Natanananda did this uh, and then it was sent off to a press to make a proof copy and it came back 
And Bhagavan himself went through every single verse. Uh, some of them he changed. He would change a few words here and there. Some of them he would cross out three of the four lines and completely rewrite them. Sometimes you see little arrows in the margin saying, move this one further down. The sequence of ideas is better if it goes down there. Overall, he did a really thorough editing job. And this is the only collection of Bhagavan's verbal spoken teachings that was written down in Tamil at the time when Bhagavan spoke the teachings and that was personally corrected, revised and edited by Bhagavan himself. So that means it's a massively important collection of his teachings. In the introduction which Natanananda had written, um, Natanananda had written, this book presents Ramana Maharshi's teachings in a pristine form. At which point Bhagavan took out his editing pen again, put a little insert carrot and added one word which either means this book alone contains Bhagavan's teachings in a pristine form or this book indeed contains Bhagavan's teachings in a pristine form. Either way, it's a massively impressive imprimatur for Bhagavan to give on this collection of teachings. So that was the first edition that came out in 1939. A later edition came out in 1974. At this point, Sadiwam, we're back to Sadiwam again, uh, had been collaborating with Muragana for many, many years. And he would go to Muragana and say, what does this, what does verse 328 mean? I don't understand it. What does 424 mean? And they would sit down together and Muragana, as I said, was a bit of an inspired ecstatic poet and often he couldn't remember why he'd written what he'd written. And there's one famous instance, I forget which verse it is, when Muragana looked at this four-line verse, uh, which Sadiwam couldn't understand and he couldn't understand it either. And he said, well, maybe one day Bhagavan will reveal to us the true meaning of this verse. So that it was a very complex work, dense, literary Tamil. And because Sadiwam had sat down with Muragana, in the 1960s and gone through every single verse with him, Sadiwam was able to extract Muragana's intent to the extent that he was able to write what's called a paraporai. A paraporai is a prose rendering of each verse, so it's an amplified uh, expansion of the original four lines in Tamil prose. So if there were any ambiguities, anything that needed to be uh, expanded on or explained a little bit, then the extra meanings or the subtleties will be brought out in the prose rendering which Sadiwam did for every single verse under the direct supervision of Muragana. Concurrently with this, uh, Professor Swaminathan, I talked about him earlier, he was uh, the editor of Gandhi's Collected Works. He was a big supporter and fan of Sadiwam and Muragana. He was also a very talented uh, Tamil uh, poet, translator. He had started his own translation of Muragana's verses, but did it directly from the verses that Muragana had wrote, had written. And I, I spoke to him uh, late 1970s, and he was uh, good enough to admit, he said, David, I didn't realize how wrong my translations were until I saw Sadiwam's version, which came out in Tamil in 1974. He said, these verses are really, really hard. It's only because Sadiwam sat with Muragana and got every bit of detail out of Muragana that we've got a proper version that we can now give to the world. And he was a little bit embarrassed because at that point he'd already translated half, half the work and it was being serialized in the mountain path and he realized that a good chunk of what he'd done wasn't correct because he didn't have the advantage of the one-on-one -on -one lessons that Sadiwam had had with Muragana in the 1960s. So this is, for me, a massive plus point, if you want to put in the, the column of Sadiwam Punyas. He actually got to sit down with Muragana, go through every single line of Guru Vajka Kovai, come up with a prose rendering of every single verse, and when the Tamil edition of the book came out, it contained the original verses. It was edited by Sadhu Om. It came out with 
Sadiwam's own expanded prose renderings and occasionally com supplementary comments by Sadiwam which he'd picked up in his conversations with Murugana. So again, a, a massive piece of scholarship brought about simply because Sadiwam had such an immense reverence for Murugana as a devotee of Bhagavan and an immense reverence for the state of the self that he knew Murugana to be in and the state of the self which was spontaneously exhibiting itself in the poetry that Murugana wrote. Uh, Sadiwam lived on here till about 1985. He used to go Pradakshina every week with a small group of people who worked with him and looked after him. If you go onto YouTube and type in Sadhu on Pradakshina, you can see some really grainy old blobby footage that goes on for about, I think an hour and a half at least. Sadhu Om is walking around the hill. Um, you, you can listen to him singing some of his songs in praise of Bhagavan. I don't think there's any record of him speaking on camera, but there's some very nice uh, songs which he composed and sang. There's this YouTube film of him walking around the hill. And interestingly, it also contains some nice footage of uh, Sadhu Natan Nanda, who lived in Ramananagar at the time, and contained uh, quite a bit of footage of Tinai Swami, who had a small house in Sadhuwam's Sadhu compound. Now, Tin Tinai Swami, Tinai means uh, the bench outside your front door in Tamil. All Tamil houses have a Tinai out front. And the idea is, this is from an era when uh, caste restrictions were far more fiercely enforced, that if somebody came to your door who you felt uh, wasn't allowed in your house for various reasons, then you did your business on the Tinai outside. So Tinai Swami got his name by sitting on a bench outside a house in Ramananaga. And he is one of the extraordinary beings who came to Bhagavan and got it very quickly in a very unusual way. He was a science professor in Chennai, I think he was a physics professor, and he used to come at weekends. He had a family in Chennai, and as was the custom in those days, on Sunday afternoon, all the people who had to go back to work in Chennai the next morning would come to Bhagavan and say, may I take leave? You didn't tell Bhagavan you were going, you just gave out this formula, may I take leave? And Bhagavan would nod or wave you off and that was it, you'd go away and come back the next weekend. When Tinai Swami turned up that Sunday afternoon, having presumably got a lecturing job the next morning in Chennai, he said, may I take leave? And Bhagavan just looked at him and said, Iru, I-R-U. Iru is the Tamil imperative of both the verb to be and the verb to stay. So in, in those three letters, in that one, in those two syllables, he was saying stay and be. So the stay component meant he couldn't go, he had to stay. The be was a direct command to his consciousness, his self, to be the self. And in that moment, Tinai Swami actually got the experience that Bhagavan had commanded him to have. He got the state of self, he got the state of being, which Bhagavan said in the word Iru, and he also got the subsidiary implication that he wasn't supposed to go back to Chennai, he had to stay in the state of the self spiritually and in the vicinity of Ramanashram spatially. So he went back to his room in Ramananaga and amazingly never went back to Chennai again in his life. He stayed uh, near Ramanashram and in the 1950s he was looked after by Sadiwam and the small community that had grown up around him. So Sad Sadiwam ended up with a uh, small compound that contained uh, people who worked with him on Murugana's Tamil works. It contained a family that looked after everybody, did the, did the cooking, and it also contained Tinai Swami in a, a little house at the front of the compound. So if you look at this old blobby YouTube footage of Sadhuam, take, take, take note of Tinai Swami. He's one of the unheralded figures in the Ramana world. He's someone who actually got it by simply being told, be.
stay by Ramana Maharshi in the 1940s. He went into a kind of trance after that. Um, it was almost impossible to speak to him most of the time. He'd be in this rather otherworldly samadhi state. Occasionally he'd get up and go for walks, but not many people ever managed to have a proper conversation with him. He was just completely paralyzed for the rest of his life by this one great powerful word from his guru Ramana Maharshi.